Well, you know, this is our, our second Saturday night service together, and uh, it's, a, it's a new thing, isn't it? Something new, and uh, I'm, I'm so glad that you were able to make it here tonight. I didn't want it to just be my wife and I again. No, no, last week, last week we had a lot of uh, new faces here. We were excited to be together again. And uh, the reason we're doing this Saturday night is because we don't know how many people are going to come on Sundays, and uh, we don't want to turn anybody away. So we're doing this Saturday night, just trying it out, see how it goes. And uh, hopefully it goes um, well. Anyway, uh, t tonight uh, we have service, but tomorrow morning is service at 10 o'clock and service at 6 o'clock in the evening. And each service is different. Um, we have a different sermon every time, different music every time. Uh, we have bands tomorrow. We don't have a band for Saturday night yet, but uh, we'll look into that and see what happens. But uh, in the meantime, we're glad everybody's watching on uh, video or on the, on the, what do you call this? Live stream. Okay, yeah, Facebook. Okay, I'm so high tech. Um, Anyway, it's, it's great to have you all here tonight. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we can gather together. We're so grateful that our government allows us to gather together. I know there's limitations, there's all kinds of rules, but that's okay. We're still allowed to be together, and we thank you for that. And Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit, who teaches us as we read your word. We thank you so much. You're such a good, good God. We give you praise and we thank you. Now, Lord, we pray that as we look into your word now, you would speak to us through the power of your Holy Spirit. Thank you so much. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Another announcement. Tonight, we have to turn our clocks backward. As fall backwards, yes. Turn your clock back. Wait, it's an hour, right? An hour? Okay. Because if you don't turn it back, you're going to be really early for, or late or something for church tomorrow. My math is wonderful. So, those are the, oh, and tomorrow, we're going to start our Sunday afternoon prayer time. So, um, a pre-service prayer at 5 o'clock on Sunday. So we pray before the, the night service. So if you can join us for that, prayer is so important. We don't want this to ever be about us. It's about Jesus Christ, and uh, we need to pray. We need to pray. Wow. We're looking at, uh, tonight we're looking at 1 John chapter 1, verse 1 to 4. And um, this is... Uh, this is a great passage. We're going to read, we're going to study through 1 John. Every Saturday night, that's what we're going to do. I don't like to pick topics. I like to preach from the Word of God, what we call expository preaching. But uh, this is a great passage of Scripture. Um, John, 1 John 1, 1 to 4. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our own eyes, which we looked upon, which we have touched with our hands, concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest, and we have seen it, and we testify to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we now proclaim also to you so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. The Apostle John is writing this letter to the church. And he's writing this letter, it's to the church in Asia Minor, but John was one of the original disciples of Jesus Christ, one of the twelve. And now all of the other, all of the other disciples at this time, they've already been killed. They died because they wrote what they testified to. They were writing the New Testament. People didn't like it. They killed them. 
John is still writing. He's the last guy alive. Instead of running for his life, he's sitting and he's writing. And he's writing 1 John. He knows it's going to cost him his life. He knows that. And eventually, he does die. Some people say he didn't get murdered. Some people say he did. The important thing is, the Lord took him home. It's fantastic. But he's writing to us. And he obviously believes what's true because he could at any time get murdered for what he's writing. There's nothing new, but again, this time, we have the false teacher problem. We talked about that in 1 Peter. We talk about that in Corinth. We talk about that in every letter that's written in the Bible. Watch out for the false teachers. And John's writing that again. We've got another problem with false teachers. They're infiltrating the fellowships. And some of these followers of Jesus were becoming lax in their standards. Some of the people in the churches, they're not paying attention and they're not being discerning. You'll, we'll read later on in, in 1 John where John talks about the anointing of God and how the anointing gives us that discernment. So the anointing is the Holy Spirit. And when we have the Holy Spirit living in us, we're able to discern. We're able to figure out what's right and what's wrong. That's what the Bible teaches. And these people were becoming very lax. They weren't paying attention to the discernment the Holy Spirit was. And they started to believe the lies. Believe the lies of the false teachers. It's into these circumstances that John steps in with his letter. So in verse 1, John says... That which was from the beginning. Th this refers to the word of life. Well, you, you wonder, wait a second, the word of life, who is that? What is that? John says the word of life was in the beginning. Well, was the beginning when, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem? Or, or was the beginning when creation happened? Is Jesus just a created being like the rest of creation? But John says, no, 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 no. The beginning. Eternity past. He's saying that Jesus Christ has always existed. He is, he is God the Son. He's always existed. Well, how do we know that that's who John's talking about when he says the word of life? Well, well, if you read John, you read any of his passages, he loves to call Jesus the Word. He likes that title. In John 1.1, 1, 1, he writes, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And who's John talking about? Talking about Jesus Christ. That's the same thing he's talking about now. It's the same person. He's talking about Jesus Christ, and he's talking, he's, he's letting us know again, just like in John chapter 1, he's letting us know Jesus is God. He's not, he's not just God the Son. That's our bad English. Our Bibles are written in English. We should have left them in Greek and Hebrew, and then we could figure it out easier. He's God the Son. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. When he says son of God, it's like what Jesus says son of man, he means that his, his parents were earthly, he had flesh. When he says son of God, his, he doesn't, he, he, he is God, just like when he's son of man, he's just like us. When he's, when he's son of God, he's, he's just like God. It, you, you can't read the Bible and say that Jesus isn't God. And John loves telling us that. We're going to see so much of that. It's beautiful. An easy way of remembering this idea is this way. Jesus was the only man who had a heavenly father, but no heavenly mother. He had an earthly mother, but no earthly father. He was older than his mother, and he was as old as his father. Did you catch that? Jesus was the only man who had a heavenly father, but no heavenly mother, because his mother was earthly. He had an earthly mother, but no earthly father, because Joseph wasn't his dad. He was older than his mother, 
because he was from eternity. And he was as old as his father, because God the Father has existed for eternity as well. That's kind of a cool way of looking at it. Something to help you remember if you can do that. Jesus is fully God, and thus he is eternal. It seems peculiar for John to tell us that he and the apostles... It's very peculiar when John says... He opens up his, his, his first couple of verses, and he says... I saw Jesus, I touched Jesus, I heard Jesus. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, and which we've looked upon and have touched with our hands. That's kind of a peculiar thing to say about somebody. And, and John throws that right away. He throws that right in at us. Why was John making such an odd statement? One answer to this question may have to do with a new philosophy that was beginning to gain ground at this time, in this era. It was called Gnosticism. That's a big word, like watermelon. Gnosticism. And, and this, this type of error, this type of philosophy, was just getting to be big in the first century. The word Gnosticism comes from the Greek word gnosis, which means knowledge. It was a combination of pagan mysticism and, and Greek philosophy. And it had two primary principles. The first principle is this. Gnosticism taught that the way of salvation was through secret, through secret knowledge. Through superior knowledge. And it was only granted to special people. The second principle was this. Gnostics believe that the flesh is evil, but the spirit is good. Gnosticism actually, it still exists today, but, but a lot of people don't realize that they're Gnostics, but they believe this stuff. So when we look at Gnosticism, what we need to remember is that if Jesus came, God the Son came to earth and became a human like us. He took on flesh. That's what it says in 2 Philippians, Philippians chapter 2. He humbled himself, became a servant just like us. Became a man so he could die in our place. If, if, if I was a Gnostic, I would say Jesus came, but he didn't take on flesh because flesh is evil. How can God take on evil? He can't. Therefore, the Jesus that was on earth was more of a ghost. He was here, but he was more of a ghost than a real person. Well, first off, John says, wait a second. I saw him. I heard him. I touched him. He wasn't a ghost. John hits this thing right square in the face. Square in the face. What John is saying is something like this. Those Gnostics who slipped into your church are teaching you something that's entirely false. They deny the incarnation of Jesus, that Jesus took on flesh. They deny that. John says, what they deny, I experienced personally. I was there with Jesus during his earthly ministry. I saw him with my own eyes. I heard him with my own ears. I touched him with my own hands. And I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that his body was real. Why is this even important? If Jesus took on flesh or if he just came as a ghost, why is that important? Well, it's important because... If Jesus didn't take on flesh, then he really wasn't human like us. And if he wasn't human like us, he couldn't die for us. He wasn't, he wasn't a good substitute for us. He needed to be a human. So Jesus on earth, 100% human, but 100% God. I, I don't want you to think I'm just saying he's human. He was 100% human, but 100% God. And he needed to be in order to take away the sin of the world. He took my sin and he took your sin and he took it upon himself. He took our death upon himself. 
A ghost can't die. Jesus had to die as a substitute for us. A propitiation for our sin. I love that word. That's a big one. Propitiation. A satisfactory substitute in the eyes of God. That's what had to be done. And so Jesus had to take on flesh. So if you're a Gnostic, you say, Jesus didn't really take away our sin because he didn't die in the flesh, but he did. He did. This is a problem in the early church in Asia Minor. How does it, how does it affect me today? Well, it affects us today because Gnosticism isn't dead. It, it's only disguised today in new garb. It's disguised. There's been a rising interest in the Gnostic writings, of, especially in, in recent years. And, and there's been some books that have brought this stuff to our attention, some, some movies. Uh, the Da Vinci Code. That was huge. People were buying the books and watching the movie. It, a lot of Gnosticism is involved in that. And, and so people were getting interested in it, and they've started looking into the writings and the, and the teachings. Teachings that deny that Jesus was here in the flesh. And that he denied, it, it denies that he died to take away our sin. It's very much alive today. We need to know about this. But Jesus is the word of life because he gives life. He alone can save us from our sins and, and give us eternal life. 1 John 4, 2. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus has come in the flesh is from God. Pay attention to that verse. Everybody who confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. So if someone comes to you and says, no, Jesus didn't come in the flesh, he was just a ghost. That person is not from God. They've got it wrong. They're heretics. It's a false teaching. As one of those who have been chosen by Jesus himself, John testifies to the reality and the truth of Jesus. And his good news, his good news message of salvation and eternal life. John says it's true. I heard him. I saw him. I touched him. John, John doesn't mention the name of Jesus until later in verse 3. But he describes Jesus with two further statements. Two further things he says about Jesus in verse 2. He says he was with the Father and he was made manifest. That little phrase, with the Father, that word with, when you, when you look at that in the Greek, the word with is like face to face. It's like, it's like I was with my wife. We were face to face. It's not, like, it's not like we were with each other, but we were totally apart. Jesus was with the Father. He was with the Father. He was face to face with the Father. John is emphasizing two things by that phrase. Both, both in the previous verse and in 1 John 1-2. Two. two things that he's emphasizing. The first is that he's equating Jesus with God the Father in terms of deity. Jesus is God. The Father is God. They're equal. Luther said this, where the Son of God is, there Christ is. Where Christ is, there the Father is. They're together. They're one. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Second, John is saying that he is not putting God the Son and God the Father together as one person. Some people say, yes, I believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And they are one, because we know they're, they're one. But, but they put them together as one personality. God the Father came to earth as God the Son, and God the Son became the Holy Spirit to dwell in you. That's what some say. That's not, that's not the Trinity doctrine. That's not the doctrine the church follows. Because that's not what the Bible teaches. 
The Father is one individual personality. The Son is one individual personality. And, and the Holy Spirit is one individual personality. But the three of them are God. That's what we teach. And it's very important. It's a very big difference. That guy we were talking about uh, last week, Stephen Furtick, Furtick and T.D. Jakes, they both teach that Jesus, God the Father, became God the Son, became God the Holy Spirit. That's not true. That's a false teaching. It's a, it's a heresy. And they were teaching it back in this early church. It's not, nothing new. There's nothing new under the sun, is there? It, it's all old. John is now testifying and proclaiming that Jesus brings forgiveness of sins and eternal life. You know, I don't, I don't know if, if you all know this, but eternal life isn't what we're looking forward to when we die. Eternal life is what God has given us now. Yeah, it'll, it'll continue on eternally after we die. But we have eternal life now. Jesus said, I came to give life and give it abundantly. He, he's given it to us. He's given us eternal life. There's no one in the Bible that says, and when you receive eternal life. It's, it's, it's you've got it. You've got it now. Eternal life isn't the length of your life. Eternal life is the quality of your life. My life is better because I have Jesus Christ. My quality of life is way better. It's, it's not that I drive a better car. It's not that I live in a better house. My quality, I have joy, unspeakable. That's not something that comes after I die. That's something I have now. I have joy, unspeakable. I can't even tell you how joyful I am, even when I'm going through trials. I have peace with God. I have it now. I don't have it when Jesus Christ returns. I, I'll still have it then. But he gives me peace now with God. Eternal life is that quality of life that we receive now. And it continues forever. Understand that? That's beautiful. That's fantastic. So Jesus came to give us eternal life. John testifies to that. Jesus Christ is the solution to the problem of how sinful people are able to get into a proper relationship with God. He's the solution. Because we're all sinners, we're separated from God, we're separated from His holiness, we're separated from God for eternity because we're all sinners. We need a rescuer. Jesus Christ took on flesh so that He could die in our place because He's the perfect sacrifice, no sin. All of us are sinners. Everybody agree? Yeah, yeah. We're all, we're all sinners. The, all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. All of us have sinned. God has forgiven us. If we put our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ, God forgives us and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. That's it. The wages of sin is death. Because we're sinners, we deserve death, eternal death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. We put our faith and our trust in Jesus, we will have eternal life. The finest quality of life. And it'll last forever. If we don't put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, we will have eternal death. The Bible says we're all going to come out of the graves. We're all going to rise. We're all going to come out of the graves. Some will rise to eternal destruction. Some will rise to eternal life. And the choice is ours. We make the choice. God gives us free will. If you love me, you'll choose me. If you don't love me, you won't. It's the same thing we do in our marriages. If I choose to love my wife, Beautiful. If I choose not to love her, we got trouble. We choose to love. Love is always a choice. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this teaching from your word. I thank you so much. I'm so grateful to you that problems existed in the early church because now we can read the letters of how we're to deal with this. God, these, these false teachers, today we live in this world, there's so many false teachers. There's so many false teachings around, oh, we need to be a people who are in the Word, a people who read and study the Word of God, showing ourselves workmen approved by Christ Jesus, rightly dividing the Word of truth. Oh God, give us the desire to read your Word. 
Oh, I pray, Lord, that we love you so much because of what you've done for us, that we, that we just want to know more about you. We want to learn more about you. And we just open up the word of God and we read and we study how we need you, Lord. How we need you. Thank you so much. Thank you for eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Thank you. We give you praise and honor and glory. We thank you and we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.